I'm Chris McDonough, a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Hi, everybody. Uh, grateful that you're here on the uh, interview room. Hey, you know, last week I did the Susan Smith uh, case, and I wanted to break that down a little bit more. So, of course, uh, the best person I could ever ask to help us understand her behavior is Greg Cooper. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Greg and the Cold Case Foundation and let you know that he actually worked Susan Smith's case uh, with the rest of the team at the Behavior Science Unit. But Greg, while assigned to the FBI Academy as a critical incident response group, he's in the critical incident response group. He served in several positions with the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. He was also the manager of the Violent uh, Crime Apprehension Program, or VICAP. He then became acting unit chief of the Behavior Profiling Unit and was also an FBI national instructor on criminal psychology, criminal investigative analysis, and analytical aspects of criminal behavior. Greg is a obviously a FBI profile from the top of the shelf, and he served with John Douglas and many others, and they're dear friends even to this day. With that, let's turn some time over to Greg and ask him to uh, give us a little better understanding of Susan. Thanks, Chris. Good to see you. Uh, appreciate your invitation this evening. Um, I've got a, a few recollections on this case because uh, I actually had the opportunity to work the case uh, when I was the acting unit chief uh, there with the BAU. I, I know that you're in the process of, of driving out to to the lake, the location uh, where this occurred. And, and what we want to consider here, as unspeakable as it is and unimaginable as it is, is what was going through Susan's mind as she was going out to this lake with her children strapped in their car seats in the back seat. Uh, so we first of all have to ask what was occurring during that day? Uh, what was happening? And keep in mind that this had been going on now uh, in her mind. She had received a Dear John letter almost a week, maybe a little bit more than a week, before this event. And in that Dear John letter, it was from a boyfriend that she had had, and whom uh, I'll just interpret it as saying, this was her ticket to her future. Uh, he was an executive in the company that she was working for, uh, and was the son of the president CEO of that company. And I, I think she perceived him as, as her ticket for the future. Uh, and a very good life. Uh, so she gets this this dear John letter, and one of the things that uh, he says in the letter, this letter actually ends up being in the in the vehicle when they pull the vehicle from the, from the lake with uh, Michael and Alexander. Uh, one of the things that he states is, and one of the reasons he's cutting the relationship off is, look at you know, not only are we different, but we want different things. And specifically, he makes mention of the fact that he's not interested in having children. He doesn't want children. And was quite adamant about it. In fact, they had talked about it before, and he makes reference to that. And therefore, he wasn't interested in raising her children. And yet he was very complimentary about her, uh, very kind in his uh, effort to discontinue the relationship, uh, very encouraging for her, talked about all of her talents and abilities. Uh, as a professional, she had been going to, uh, was encouraging her to go to school, get a degree, and, and that he would continue to help her uh, find good work. Um, 
And so imagine that now for this last week, she's trying to uh, resurrect, if you will, or reconcile with this young who has no interest in a romantic relationship. As stated in the letter, he wants to maintain a friendship with her uh, and thinks very highly of her. But he has no interest in a romance. Well, she recognizes the friendship's not going to do it for her. She wants to, to reconcile with him. Now, that day of the event, and I will call it, uh, she actually goes to him, to his office, and attempts to reconcile and approach him and talk with him. And he escorts her out of the building. No interest whatsoever. She leaves and uh, goes back to, to work. And then uh, later that day, she ends up picking her children up from daycare, places them in the back seat. She says that she's uh, suicidal. Uh, but she's considering uh, not only taking her own life, but the life of her children, as she doesn't want uh, the children to grow up without a mother. And <clears throat> she actually talks to a friend of her that, hers that day who she knows had gone to dinner with a group of people and this boyfriend that she had. Uh, and she asks this friend of hers whether or not he mentions anything to her. Uh, about Susan and their relationship. And she responds that, you know, there was no reference made whatsoever. So she's obsessed throughout this last week and that particular day about reconciliation. And she recognizes, based upon that letter, that there are two main obstacles in her mind, two main obstacles. He does make mention of other issues that uh, would not permit him to continue this relationship with her. But in her mind, it's the two main obstacles, and that is her children. At some point, she makes the decision that this is the only thing keeping her from the life that she desires. In fact, she even makes a statement to one of her friends at the previous week. Um, I wonder what life would be like without my children, if I didn't have children. So we know that she's thinking about, fantasizing about a life without that responsibility and what life would be with this young man and the quality of her life. She's had a very difficult life. It's stressful, um, among other things that we don't need to go into now. But what's happening then? <clears throat> As she's driving out to the lake now, uh, she's recognizing and has come up with this conclusion that this is the way that she's going to resolve her issue. And it's so strong that she's willing to give up the two most important things previously had been the most important things in her life, that being her children, recognizing that they're the obstacles to this ultimate life that she wants. Well, as we know, uh, what happens there while she has uh, has the vehicle with her children in it. She now has to actually put the brake on her vehicle so she can exit the vehicle. She has driven down the ramp partially for it to roll into the water. She puts it in the gear, recognizing she has to place it in the gear to release it. She puts the emergency brake on. She has to release that emergency in order to allow those, the car containing her children to roll into the water. She indicates eventually in her confession that she, she stops a couple times as she's moving down the ramp where she has the time to consider this and the consequences. Regardless, she doesn't. And she does make a statement in the original story that she came up with that when the black, allegedly the black man in the vehicle drives off with the children, her children were calling out for her. I believe that that's an, uh, an accurate, truthful statement. I believe that her children were calling out for her, but it wasn't in the 
context of that story. It was in the context of when she allowed that vehicle to roll in the water uh, with her children inside the vehicle calling out for her. I believe that that happened. And so as you consider all this time, this whole week preceding that, from the time that she receives that letter and trying to reconcile and figure out, okay, what do I have to do in order to acquire my objective? What are my obstacles? She identifies those obstacles and she removes those obstacles. As unspeakable and unimaginable as it possibly is. It's a heartbreaking case um, for America at the time that they were watching this thing. <clears throat> it was an unbelievable case. How could anybody uh, commit such an act? Well, that's a good thing. It's a good thing that we can't understand. We can't imagine. Uh, because that's the kinds of things that prevent us from doing. So this goes back to the concept of, all right, what's what's the a defense attorney? Going to do? Well, there's really only one defense here that's acceptable, if at all. And that is, well, she must have been insane at the time, even temporary insanity at the time that she committed this act. Well, that's fine and dandy if it happened impulsively. But all the behaviors that she was involved in up to from the time she receives that, that letter, the Dear John letter, which was contained in the car, found in the car when they brought it out of the water, up until the time that she commits the act, including those activities that she did that day preceding the event, all suggest to us that this was pre-planned, premeditated, and orchestrated very specifically in order to achieve her objective. And that was freedom and liberty to pursue the life that she wanted. I'll hand it back to you, Chris. Thanks for your time, buddy.